United we play. United we win. It's his world, and we're all just paying the rent. All hits all the time. We are family. Mexers are double-digit Ks. We're busting ours to kick yours. Fun to watch. Minus 15. Respect all, fear none. Into the upper deck. Intensity is not a perfume. Hello, Utah Street. Five, four, three, two, one. It is no joke. We have made it to the end of March and opening day is just over 24 hours away from now. Welcome into the Mass and All Access podcast, everyone. I guess officially our last of spring training as the regular season gets underway on uh, Thursday evening with the Nationals hosting the Mets. Max Scherzer versus Jacob deGrom uh, from Nationals Park. Thanks so much for making us a part of your dark gray early Wednesday afternoon. Hopefully we're getting you pumped up and excited for the start of the 2021 regular season um, as the Nationals kick off another baseball campaign, a full campaign um, with uh, a full 162 game seasons, uh, 62 games during the season. So we're excited to have you that. Thanks so much for tuning in um, on Facebook, YouTube, on our Twitter live. Uh, be sure to be comment along throughout the course of the uh, episode. We love having he- uh, hearing from you guys and, um, and making you part of the conversation. And of course, if you're not watching live, you can also catch the podcast after the fact on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or SoundCloud. Be sure to listen to the whole thing. Um, For those of you that subscribe to the podcast on the audio platforms, uh, there will be a special announcement that I will tease later on in the show, at the end of the show, um, that you will be able to hear uh, later this week. So stay tuned for that. But for now, let me bring in uh, my co-host, Amy Jennings, uh, from the safety of her own home via a Zoom call. Amy, we made it. Uh, opening day is tomorrow, April 1st. Um, spring training went by incredibly fast. I cannot. It seems like we were just having pitchers and catchers report, and here we are about to start April. I know. I really can't believe it. I feel like maybe I wasn't the most optimistic person that everything would go as smoothly as it did, and we'd get here so fast, but we're here, and I couldn't be more excited. I was These past two weekends, I've been at my, my dad coaches at a JUCO here in Maryland, and uh, this year my brother's playing for him. In the past two weekends, I've been going to their games, and it was the first time I had been at a live baseball game with fans in the stands in well over a year. So that was super exciting, and I know once pro ball gets kicked off tomorrow, it's going to be even more exciting for everybody ac- across the whole country yeah and it's gonna be exciting because uh, you have a full day of baseball i think games start at one o'clock nationally um of course there's some other local games you can watch and the nationals will be a part of your nightcap at seven o'clock on on uh, mets and congrats to all those lucky fans that got tickets are able to be there in person uh the nationals did held held their annual well, semi-annual they didn't have one last year but uh, media toured the ballpark explaining all the rules all the health and safety protocols so they got that covered for you so I'm sure fans are eager to get back to Nationals Park after not been there since Game 5 of the 2019 World Series, which is crazy enough uh, as it sounds. We've got a packed episode for you, of course, uh, with the regular season and getting underway. Uh, We're going to talk about how difficult this schedule is, especially at the uh, get-go for the Nationals um, and how they're going to have to really fight their way to try to contend for a playoff spot. We're going to break down what we anticipate the opening day roster will be. Um, of course, there was some major news coming across uh, the, the bar uh, over the weekend on Sunday in terms of, uh, of the roster and who's going to be starting at third base, which is what we're going to kick off with, uh, Amy. And that news, of course, was uh, Carter Keboom being sent down to the AAA level. He was optioned. He will not be the Nationals opening day third baseman. Um, kind of surprising. But we kind of also saw it coming last week when we were talking about Starling Castro getting uh, reps at third base in some spring training games uh, and, and in the backfields at the ballpark of the Palm Beaches. Uh, just kind of your initial reaction of, of seeing Carter being officially optioned down and, and knowing that he's not going to start the season with the big league club. Right. I mean, just seeing what we've seen in spring training and his results at the big league level so far, you can't really be too surprised. They couldn't put him out there on opening day as their starting third baseman um, and expect positive results. I just don't think that's realistic. Um, However, if you're only listening to what the front office is saying, what Davey Martinez was saying throughout the whole offseason, throughout the whole spring, you might be a little surprised by this um, and that these things are moving around. But to to you and I who have seen him play, um, kind of 
of seen how this this has unfolded, we can't be really too surprised, especially last week. I mean, you said this is something like heads up. This is a big deal that Starlin Castro made that start at third base in one of their last spring training games. And here we are. He is going to be the Nationals starting third baseman. And we talked about it last week, too. It's not like Carter Keboom didn't get his fair shake at the job. I mean, he was their starting third baseman for the majority of camp. Um, and, and just couldn't pull it together. And, and, you know, we also talked about last week how this is a team that for it, he couldn't start for many reasons. And to go through them real quickly, one, they can't afford another slow start. And looking at the schedule, which we will do in a bit, uh, it, it, they can't have zero production from the third base spot in the lineup or in the field. Um, two, th- this is a team that is looking to compete throughout the course of the season, and he wasn't giving them that during spring training. Uh, and they can't afford to have him be the reason that this team is not winning ball games. And Carter mentioned this when we talked to the media. We'll hear from him in, in a bit as well. Um, but you know, he can't be the reason this offense or this team isn't getting going. Not just not uh, not get off to a good start, but throughout the course of the season, he can't be the reason this team doesn't make it. And three, how much more? Better, how, how much better is he going to get by just kind of dragging along in the major league level? I mean, it, it, how, that's going to be a huge shot to his confidence. Um, he, you know, if he can't compete at this level yet, what's the point of having him up there? Let him get his reps. Also, what's the point of putting him on the opening day roster if he's not going to start? You know, we've heard Mike Rizzo talk about this all the time and Davey Martinez uh, when it comes to their top prospects. They're not going to bring them up just to bring them up. They want them playing every day, no matter where it is. Uh, and if if Carter Keepum wasn't going to be, look, he's good enough. He he's good enough to be on the opening day roster, right? You know, no one's saying that he he wasn't worthy of a spot. But I, I think it's more. It also comes down to look, we need him to get better, and he's not going to be able to work on that a day in and day out while being our starting third baseman or being our backup infielder. We want him at uh, another site practicing third base every day, getting regular at-bats every day, seeing game action every day, because he's not going to get that at this point uh, with the big league club. Plus, not to mention, you know, you bring him up, he struggles, and you you are pretty confident that he's not going to be your third baseman of the future anymore. You don't want to hurt his trade value anymore. You know, you want him to, 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 to get that trade value back up because eventually that might be what this this comes down to realistically for the Nationals. But the kind of unfortunate thing is it happening so late in spring training. Um, I, I imagine they were coming up with the plan all along, but I'm really not so sure. Um, and this creates a huge ripple effect because now you have who was originally your starting second baseman moves over to third and Josh Harrison, who you thought was only going to play, you know, a fraction of games is now going to be your everyday second baseman. So that causes a huge ripple effect, really cuts the depth of this infield and resulted on some guys making the team in Hernan Perez and Jordy Mercer, who we might not have anticipated otherwise. Yeah. And I think that's a good point too, because you know, those guys are, and this is not a, a shot at them, and with all due respect, those guys are, are, are backups. They're, they're bench players. They're, they're role players, and they do that job very well, and that's why they were going to make this team uh, with or without Carter Keboom. But Keboom, his lack of production, if you look at his numbers for that, throughout the end of spring training, they actually got worse from when we looked at them last week. Um, and shout out to the Nats fan that tweeted at me that I had the, the, the year wrong in last week's stats graphics, so I fixed that. It's 2021 spring training. Uh, but 17 games, a 133 average, six hits, 17 strikeouts, uh, only four walks. So it's not like he wasn't even hitting the ball. He wasn't getting on base either. So it'd be one thing if, wow, he couldn't find the barrel, but at least he was drawing his walks, getting on base. His defense was okay. It was spotty at times, kind of like we saw last year. Metric-wise, it was probably pretty good, but... You know, you don't want the, the slump at the plate to affect the defense uh, in the field and, and the glove, the glove work. So, um, yeah, I, I, th- this is not a shot at, at Harrison, Mercer, Perez, but they are at this point in their careers pretty much bench guys um, and, and, and backup roles that would have done very well had the Nationals have an everyday third baseman um, and, and Carter Cuban fulfilled that. But now they're thrust into more of a prominent role, a starting role. Josh Harrison is going to start at second base tomorrow night with with Starlin Castro starting at third base. Uh, start, and it also moves, like you said, Castro over to a position he doesn't play normally. Uh, ha- he has some experience there, but not that much compared to second base. So uh, it, it has a major ripple effect on this infield, on this roster, uh, how David Martinez is going to manage ball games. Yes, Harrison and Hernan Perez, which we talked about last week too, also bring a, a certain amount of versatility. They can play multiple positions across the field. Josh Harrison, we know, has some, some 
uh, experience in the outfield as well. Uh, he was getting some reps in, in spring training. So that is something that attracts the Nationals, too, that Carter Cuban does not bring. Because well, it's not like they can just slide Carter Cuban over to second base or back to shortstop when he was uh, as a, growing as a prospect. Because uh, you've got Trey Turner there. You've got Starling Castro there. So, yeah, there's a major ripple effect on this roster, and we'll look at the roster in a little bit. Um, but all in all, surprising, yet it was kind of written on the wall because we – have been saying Carter Cuban was the opening day third baseman since the end of last year. And, you know, what is it? Four days ahead of opening day, he gets optioned down. I think it's just a major disappointment and, and something that Nationals fans could, rightfully so, could be a little concerned about. Right. And I don't know that we have to worry so much about Castro at third base or necessarily the the talent of Josh Harrison at second base. But it's the workload. You know, Josh Harrison hasn't played 100 games since 2017. So now that he's going to be going out there and playing every day, it's kind of a completely different ball game. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the good news is that he's had he had, you know, good numbers last year, a great on base percentage. And and this year he's hit the heck out of the ball in the spring. I mean, it hit 417 this spring, went 15 for 36 um, and and had great numbers last year as well. So you can't be too concerned about the talent level there. It's just about the workload, I would say more. And same thing with Sterling Castro. He's played a lot of innings at third base in his career. I'm not too concerned about that. Plus, you know, he has that bat that's going to be necessary um, to, to make this lineup productive. Uh, but it's just that workload. And then everybody else beyond there that kind of takes a utility player out of the mix. So then you really might be relying on the Jordy Mercers and Hernan Perez's uh, t- to get a lot more innings than they would have ever imagined. Yeah, and uh, I, I, I did sound like, I don't mean to like be like, hey, these guys can't get it done. They're backups. They're used in small spurts. But, you know, they, these are major league ball players. And, and like you said, we saw Josh Harrison tear the cover off the ball in spring training. How that translates to the regular season obviously remains to be seen. Uh, but, he, you know, he played well in spots last year for the Nationals in a shortened season. We know his track record uh, playing with the Pirates uh, for a long time. Uh, uh, Starling Castro has played with the Marlins for and the Cubs has a, has a good year, former All-Star. So it's these, these guys have a track record. It's just the thing is you're now you're almost counting too much on these guys, right? The Nationals need production from particularly third base. You know, you, you can probably get by with – decent production from second base, but third base is a high value position that and shortstop. Those are your two high value positions on the infield and they, the nationals need production. It can't just be Trey Turner and Juan Soto carrying this offense. Hopefully you get some power from Josh Bell, Kyle Schwarber, Ryan Zimmerman. Hopefully Victor Robles gets on base at a higher clip um, and is scoring more runs and stealing around 30 bat bags over the course of the season. But you need Castro and whoever's going to play second base, whether it be Harrison or Perez, um, or sometimes Jordy Mercer, to drive in runs, to hit home runs, mm-hmm. uh, to to get on base, um, have a high, a high OPS, slug the ball, uh, and play solid defense. And these guys can do that. Uh, I think your point of that, can they withstand it over a long period of time? Um, it'll be interesting. But you got that three, four-man rotation. You were able to give some guys some time off. So if it calls for it, Assuming everyone's producing at about average for their careers, the Nationals probably could squeak by. But then again, you're also counting a lot from guys like Juan Soto and Trey Turner and probably Josh Bell and Kyle Schwarber. Uh, I haven't even mentioned the catcher position yet. So, uh, yeah, it, it's not just the infield that this move affects. It affects the whole roster and the whole lineup and, and where this team is going to offensively uh, produce runs. Yeah, well, and here's my thing is if you were looking at it just from an offensive production standpoint, then maybe this is really good news for Nats fans because I would almost rather not take the the gamble at the beginning of the season with Carter Keyboom and see if he can finally hit at the big league level. I would rather stick in bats that you know can 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 produce at the big league level. Josh Harrison, you know, or take the gamble and, you know, put Hernan Perez in there a couple of games uh, because he has a proven track record at the big league level where Carter Keeboom, you know, you're, I mean, so far you haven't gotten results. So it's almost kind of good news that you're not having to take that gamble at the beginning of the season. Of course, the disappointment of having such a highly touted prospect and you think he's going to be the third baseman of your future and he's just not doing it yet is disappointing, but they're not having to take the gamble at this point yet. And maybe he'll go, 
you know, be at the alternate site and then and we know they're going to play games there and then he'll eventually go to Rochester, play games there. Maybe he'll, he'll get things going, figure it out and, and come back and join this team. But we just don't know. And maybe it's good news that they're not taking that that chance to start the season off because it is such a difficult schedule there to start the season. Yeah, exactly. We don't know. But what we do know is uh, what the plan now is for Carter Key. Boom. Davey Martinez, of course, meeting with the media the day the Nationals, or I guess technically it was the day after they were off the day they made the official roster move. Uh, but this past Sunday, Davey Martinez uh, meeting with the media discussing Carter Key, boom, and the decision to option him down to the AAA level and what that means for him and his future uh, moving with the Nationals uh, forward and what he's going to be working on at the alternate site in Fredericksburg. So here is David Martinez uh, from this past Sunday discussing Carter Keeboom. Yeah, so, you know, with Carter, um, we really felt strongly about uh, getting into some kind of rhythm and not putting so much pressure on him. Uh, let him get started. He's going to go to Fredericksburg and uh, – continue to work on his development, work on his swing, um, work on his overall play. And when he's ready, um, we'll get him, we'll get him here, you know, when, when we, when we feel like he's ready, but um, you know, not by any means. And I talked to Carter, you know, this is, you know, we want to get him right. You know, we want to take the pressure off him um, and I'll get him down and get him going. Uh, but he's a big part of our future. I, you know, I, I've said it before and I'll say it again, that, you know, we want Carter here. We want Carter to be our every third, everyday third baseman. Uh, in the future so uh, but we want to make sure that you know we get him right and get him in rhythm and he's a good good player he's going to be a good player uh we want him just to relax and, and go find a swing and um and get him get him going do you think that's something that he could do in like a month before the minor league season begins uh you know we have we definitely have uh you know Fredericksburg. Uh, my understanding that they're going to be able to play some games down there now uh, with opposing teams you know we'll have games going out throughout the, you know throughout the day um, so we'll get tons of at-bats. Um, he'll work on you know, situational hitting, all the things we want him to work on. Uh, but he'll have tons, tons of opportunity to get tons of at-bats. So um, like I said, you know, he's going to go down there and work on some things that we deem that he needs to work on. And uh, hopefully he gets better and he gets better quick. How did he take the news? Yeah, he was fine. He was fine. You know, he understood. You know, he, he thanked me for the opportunity. Um, but I told him, I said, this is not the last time I'm going to see him. And believe me, I said, you know, we'll, get, we'll be together for a long time. So uh, just go down there. You know, the biggest thing is, is to get to work right away and uh, stay positive. You know, and I told him it's going to happen. I, look, um, I play with a lot of a lot of players. I've seen a lot of a lot of good players that got sent down um, early. And they, you know, next thing you know, they were in the big leagues, 9, 10, 11 years. So um, I told him, I said, you'll, you'll get it. And, you know, and you know, you belong here. You know, you're going to play here. So just, you know, just get, get ready to go. When you say that you would like Carter to get ready, what does he need to do to be ready to be up with you guys full time? Consistency, you know, consistency. That's, I mean, that's the biggest thing. Um, he's gotten better at playing third base, you know, now we want him to get consistent with his, with his bat, you know, um, you know, hit the ball over the field. Like, like we know he's capable of doing or run into, run into balls, you know, run into balls as far as hitting home runs, you know, cause we know he can do that. Um, but he's got to have consistent at bats, you know, and that's something that he's going to work on down there. And um, like I said, hopefully it comes sooner than than later, because um, we we want him back, you know. And uh, but you know we want to make sure that um, he's positive, you know, that he stays positive, and that he continues to work and and, and get better. A lot to take away from what David Martinez had to say about Carter Keyboom and his plans for the young infielder moving forward. Obviously, Amy, a big takeaway there is that he will be going to the alternate site um, in Fredericksburg, not staying in West Palm Beach, um, and will be staying nearby, which I guess is a good thing uh, with, for the Nationals in case they need to call him up for any reason. He'll be getting his work done there. They will looks like playing some kind of games uh, with even of, of official umpires in attendance to, to manage the games. Um, uh, looks like a lot of those will come against the Orioles uh, alternate site team, uh, maybe some other teams mixed in here and there, but uh, it's a good sign that at least... Carter Cuban is not just going to like be taking batting practice every single day. He'll actually get some in-game situations. Exactly. And that's, I think that's the most important point is that they're going to be playing games. Um, there's not going to be a lapse and growth there um, and in and, and game situations, which is going to be really important as he, you know, tries to fix his approach at the plate. Uh, Cause we just saw a lot of bad at bat. So playing those in-game situations, live hitting is going to be super important for Carter Cuban. Another thing David kept saying was, 
you know, and this obviously it's, to a certain extent, he kind of has to say this that we understand. Um, but I think it's worth mentioning that, you know, he kept referring to, you know, we want him back. We want Carter Keboom back and we want him to be our third baseman. Um, obviously any manager or front office staff is going to say that about the guy that they, well, I guess Dave Martinez didn't draft him, but you know what I mean? That groomed him, um, right. and, and brought him up. Um, but at, at the same time, you know, you also have to think of on the other side of the coin, they want to be right about this guy, right? They, they've invested a lot in Carter Keboom and, and their future at third base. They let Anthony Rendon go because they figured Carter Keboom was going to be the long-term solution at third base. Um, they did not trade Carter Keboom because they thought he was going to be the long-term solution at third base. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. They they want to, but they, you know, they want the success for the young man. Uh, young man, who am I? He's 23. Uh, I'm, I'm like six years older than him. Uh, but they want him to have success. You know, they want him to be a good player. They like the guy, but they also want to be right about him. So it's something to keep in mind, uh, too, when the, the Nationals are kind of working around how Carter Keeping fits in their plans and with, and with this team. Right. And it has to be so frustrating for him, too, because I don't know if it maybe it's a pressure thing because there's been so I mean, one on one edge of the sword, they're trying to build this confidence and saying that you're our guy, you're our guy. You think that gives a young player that confidence, but also puts a lot of pressure on him. And he hit so well at AAA and then comes up in 2019 and can't do it. Um, same thing in 2020. So I don't know if it's a pressure thing or what what it is. But the good news about him is he's a super hard worker. Uh, he, he He's in the cages. He's doing his best. Of course he is. Uh, but it's frustrating for him as well. And it, 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 yeah, it just has to be frustrating all around. But hopefully he can he can get those results, get better at bats at the alternate site, and we'll see him up with the big league team. Or maybe he'll be one of those players that they end up trading and he has this very successful career somewhere else. It just clicks. You never know. You never know. And we hope the latter isn't the uh, the, the answer, right? Because, you know, we as both reporters and fans of the team and fans all, all across the area, they want the Nationals to be right about Carter Keebum too. Uh, because if not, how long are we going to be talking about, well, they should have signed Anthony Rendon. Well, they should have gone out and got another third baseman. Well, they should have traded for Chris Bryant. Uh, we'll hear that till the end of time if Carter Keebum doesn't pan out here. Uh, but what Davey wants to see from him is that consistency. We had not seen that from Carter Keeboom other than at the AAA level. At the major league level, you know, he's hitting below the Mendoza line. He recorded one extra base hit all of last year. Um, defensively, you know, he looks great for a couple of games, then he kind of struggles, then he looks great again. Uh, the key, obviously, here is consistency with Carter. Uh, can he find that? You know, I think we'll have some more clarity on that if he goes down to the alternate site, crushes the ball, plays well defensively. Once the AAA season gets underway in May, I believe, uh, he starts playing well there. And if he gets his call up sometime later this summer uh, and isn't able to find it to play, maybe we'll know that he just won't be that consistent kind of player uh, at the major league level. Uh, but there's still time for him to figure it out. So consistency is something that he clearly needs to work on, and that's what the Nationals want to see. We talked about the pressure. You just mentioned the pressure, Amy, that Carter Keeboom is facing. He talked about that at length um, when he met with the media. And I have a lot of thoughts about what Carter Keeboom, he talked about, I think, over 15 minutes with the media on Sunday. Um, if you missed any of that um, inner, or that press conference, it's all on the Mass and Nationals YouTube channel. But here is like a three-minute clip of Carter Keeboom talking about um, what uh, his reaction to the news being optioned down and what he's working on and what he thinks he needs to do to uh, get better uh, and become the third baseman that the Nationals expect him to be. I'm going to keep a good attitude. I'm going to do, I'm going to do, I'm going to do what I have to do. And um, you know, if it takes, if it takes a week, great. If it takes two weeks, takes a month, so be it. And um, you know, I, I, I'm here to work. There's, a, there's no frustration. There's no, um, anger towards anything. Um, it, it's, it's get better every single day and, um, ultimately find get back to what got you here. And, uh, that, that, that's what I was doing today. What do you think still needs to sync up that maybe hasn't synced up yet? Um, you know, it, it's, it, it's, I, I, not to be no, no specific. I think it's just, um, it, it's, it's a timing and, um, I'm seeing the baseball a lot better this year than I, than I saw last year with everything. And, um, you know, even, even if I make a poor decision, it's, I, I'm, I'm able to make that adjustment a lot quicker right now and, um, get to where I would like to be. Um, 
but it's a matter of repeating that. And, you know, I could feel it one at bat, or I could feel it two, three at bats. And then the fourth at bat, you know, you don't feel it. And, um, that, that I think that's the frustrating part with, with, with this going on right now is, um, you know, I, I feel I have it, I have it, I have it. And then, you know, it's gone and it could be gone the next round. And it's like, you know, that's weird. That's not, that's not usually who I am as a player. I always just kind of continue to do it and, and, and had it and had those, stuck with a few thoughts and, and, and it's been consistent. And, um, you know, it's, it, it, it sucks that it happens. I said it earlier this year, you know, it happens and it's, that's fine. I'm there's, I don't have any more frustration for frustration to give towards it. It's just show up every day, um, get better and, and get back to who I was. With all that being said, what was just your reaction outlook to the roster move yesterday? I understand. Um, you know, I get it. You, we, we have to win and I want our team to win. And you know what? I wasn't in a, I was not in the position to, uh, I, I don't think give, give ourselves at, at that moment, at this moment in time, give ourselves that, that best opportunity to, to win the games. If, if um, I, I need to go down and, and get my swing right. And I know I'm, a, I know I'm the guy that can help this team win a lot of ball games. Um, but you know, right now I, I definitely still have uh, some things I, I want to, um, I, I want to work on it and, and get to that point where it's an everyday thing for me again. And, um, it, it's, it's in there. I know it's in there and, and I feel it. Um, it's just a matter of doing it every day and I'm excited and this isn't, it, yeah, it's frustrating to be sent down and stuff like that, of course. But at the same time, you know, I look at it as, as an opportunity to, um, go down there, relax and, and get, and get right. And, um, take, take what's offered to me. And I'll, I know I'll be back up there with the team and, and helping them out. So, um, there, there's no, there's no frustration towards it. I, I completely understand the, the, the move and, and, and the decision they made and direction they went. So it's, um, it's part of it and, uh, I'll be better for it. So genuine and professional from a 23 year old Carter Cuban. I, I was very impressed, you know, not many players would do that. Not, you don't hear from any prospects once they get demoted, uh, or sent down to the minor league camp or, or demoted to the, to the minor leagues right away. But, you know, the day after, of course, still with the Nationals there, and he, he went up and spoke up to the media. And, again, talked to, like, for, like, over 15 minutes with, with the local media. Um, and then that, that interview is, in its entirety, is on the Mass and Nationals YouTube channel. Uh, I was really impressed. I mean, I, I don't think we talk enough, Amy, about Carter Cubum, the person, versus the player and all of this. Because, I mean, it's it cannot be easy for a guy like him and a kid. He's 23 years old entering his third major league season um, that he's not going to even start this season at the big league level. Uh, and he's had all the pressure in the world you'd mentioned on his shoulders, um, big shoes to fill, obviously at third base. Um, and he handled it with a lot of class. And I, I was very impressed with Carter. Mm -hmm. I know because you and I both know, and in, in this job, you have players that just simply won't talk to the media. Yeah. Then you have players who do, but have an attitude or don't take responsibility for what's going on at the plate. And then you have guys like Carter Keboom who sit up there, get demoted, and talk for 15 minutes to the media about everything that they're doing wrong, which isn't easy to do. Uh, so he showed a lot of character there, and that's really important um, because a lot of this game is mental, as we know. So if he's hardworking and he has that approach and he understands and he wants to get better, uh, which, of course, reasonably he would, um, that's half the battle. And it's easy for us to sit here and talk about everything that's going wrong and not acknowledge that hitting a baseball is arguably the hardest thing to do in all of sports. Yeah. Um, and the Nationals organization obviously sees a lot of talent in this guy and has been very patient. I know we have somebody commenting, Jorge, on Facebook saying that the Nationals organization has been too patient with this guy and they should have signed somebody in the offseason. But clearly their patience means that they see something um, – whether it's still there or not, or they're just trying to be optimistic or not, we don't know. Um, but hopefully he gets there, and whether it's something that clicks and he starts hitting or it takes time, changes his approach, we don't know. But they see something in him, and he, he has the mental part of the game down. So that's that's a lot. That has a lot to do with it. Yeah, I mean, this is a guy that they drafted in the first round. He was one of their top position prospects from the get-go. He was their top overall prospect for a year before being called up. So, yeah, they see a lot of potential in him. And I think 
you know, now just thinking about it, like they probably see a lot in his character too. They probably see the work ethic and the desire to get better. Um, if you're just listening along, or even if you watch along, you can see the frustration in his face. You can hear it in his voice. I mean, he's he's very calm and respectful and, and professional about it. But you can just say he's like, man, I, I just can't get it going. Uh, it's very frustrating. And, and like you know, the ups and downs. We've all been there, right? We've all had something that we know we can do. And we're, we just can't get it together. And it's, it's a very frustrating feeling. So, you know, something that we can kind of relate to to kind of keep him on that point. Like, I, I can think of things that I was like, why can't I do this right now? I mean, I, I always do this. This is very annoying. So, uh, you know, it, it does kind of show the human aspect of the game. Um, and, and the other thing I wanted to point out is just like his, his term, relax. He says, I just, I just want to go and relax and, and, and feel comfortable. You know, it's, it's a sport. He's playing a sport for a living. He should be having fun. Um, I know there's a lot of pressures becoming uh, being the third baseman of a defending World Series champion team, a team that expects to win every year. Um, but he should be having fun out there. And if he's putting too much pressure on himself, maybe he does need to kind of reset uh, or more time to kind of reset and not have to think of that pressure um, and, and just kind of relax more, like he said, and, and have fun playing baseball as opposed to just kind of uh, crumbling with all that pressure. Yeah, exactly. We get on here really often and we're really hard on Carter Keyboom, uh, but we do wish him the best and and hopefully we have more positive news as the, the minor league season gets going. Hopefully he figures things out and we'll be able to talk to him and talk about him in a more positive light uh, here coming up pretty soon. <laughs> yeah, but as for him, I mean, the, unfortunately for for those of our listeners and viewers who, who are, are, are now tired of hearing about Carter Keyboom, Probably won't be talking about him for a while. He's not starting the season with the team, so we'll get a little break from the Carter Keyboom news and, and notes. But uh, we can move on with this conversation. And now that Carter Keyboom we know will not be on the opening day roster, who will be uh, as we kind of start our regular season preview. Um, not set in stone. The Nationals won't announce this until Thursday morning, early afternoon-ish. But here's what we got pretty much. They did go with a five-man bench and an eight-man uh, relieving uh, eight-man bullpen. Um, the only real surprises here or, or names that just jump out to you are, of course, left-hander Luis Avilan. We talked about him a lot last week and how they will keep an extra left-handed uh, pitcher in that bullpen with Brad Hand. Um, and then the bench players we talked about, Jordy Mercer, Hernan Perez, Alex Avias, your backup catcher, Andrew Stevenson, your backup outfielder, uh, Ryan Zimmerman, your backup first baseman. Um, and, and just a quick glance at that rotation everyone knows about the rotation that's not the exact order we will we'll hear from david martinez later today actually the media and he'll lay out the starting rotation but you know scherzer strasburg corbin lester ross uh those are those that's a good rotation to have to start a season and they're going to lean heavily on those guys uh, early on Yep, exactly. I mean, I think my biggest takeaway from all of that is that you saw production from guys that you might have been a little bit iffy on, like your Ryan Zimmerman coming back after a year, year off. He had a great spring training. Uh, Josh Bell obviously impressed at the plate throughout spring training. Um, so so there's, those are guys that you, you wanted to see results out of over the spring and you are leading up to the regular season starting tomorrow. Um, I think the biggest concern is still bullpen depth because a lot has changed from when we first talked about it going into spring training um, and defense. We know they really didn't make any defensive improvements and throughout the spring, it's not like their defense looked wonderful. Um, so I think those are two two of the biggest concerns just looking at this roster, um, obviously adding Luis Avalon as that extra lefty in the bullpen um, just shows some of the, the, the lacks in their bullpen um, and their defense is a cause of concern, but there were some pl- a pluses. A lot of guys surprised us uh, throughout spring training. So those are my biggest takeaways, but obviously a lot's going to change from opening day to May to June. Uh, so we're going to get to see that all unfold firsthand. Yep. And, and in terms of the back, the backup uh, bullpen and kind of the depth right there, I mean, yeah, there's, uh, you know, you got Brad Hen, Hudson, Rainey. Those are your main guys. Of course, Will Harris. While the Nationals got good news about him, still no certain timetable of when he'll be able to return. Uh, and then you've got Kyle Finnegan and Avilan and Fetty Voth are your emergency starters, long relievers. Um, but they did option Seth Romero and Rilio Armenteros down uh, to the alternate site. They'll be nearby in case needed. Um, so will Kyle McGowan, Sam Clay. Um, so there, there are guys that are still kind of in the mix. They're not on the opening day roster, but they're in the mix and they will be, um, you know, available to the nationals, God forbid, if need be, uh, early on in the season. So, you know, it's kind of, 
you know, with the alternate site, Amy, and then also with the travel taxi squad we're going to see again this year, it's almost like a 31-man roster, right? You get five <laughs> guys on that taxi squad. You've got a handful of guys at the alternate site. So, yeah, obviously there are some uh, logistical things that need to happen in terms of sending guys down, putting guys on the injured list, whatever it may be. But you do have a, a larger pool than normal uh, to select guys from um, um, then you would, it's not just like a straight demotion at AAA. There's the alternate site and then there's the uh, taxi squad. So the nationals, while not very obvious on the official 26 man roster, they do have some uh, available options to back them up uh, if need be to start the season. Mm-hmm. That's important because realistically, I don't know if this is going to be a hundred percent normal season and really important for the nationals. Cause they're going to need a lot of fluidity fluidity um, in that bullpen, especially towards the beginning of the season. I think we're going to see a lot of guys up, a lot of guys down, a lot of changes. Um, but hopefully once they get into to, to mid season, once you get into June, July, you have more set um, and guys are producing that are supposed to be doing well. Yeah. Um, you mentioned June, July, um, let's talk about the schedule for a little bit because I'm fascinated by this, Amy. I'm, I don't know about you, but the Nationals have just an absolute brutal schedule coming up. Um, and uh, I, 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 we talked about it briefly throughout spring training. The Nationals cannot afford like a 19 and 31 start. Uh, they, they, Dave Martinez has preached this throughout the course of spring training. We really need to get uh, all, like playing in April like we were playing in May. You know, so you know he's kind of pushing back everything. Uh, so the Nationals don't get off to a slow start, which we've seen them do in the past. And, you know, obviously 2019, 2018 as well. Uh, pretty much any year they didn't make the playoffs, they kind of had a slow start. Uh, and it's just going to be a, a brutal stretch. Uh, of course, opening day against the Mets. Let's take a look at these. And these graphics are courtesy of the, the Washington Nationals um, and their social media account. But, uh, of course, the Mets for three games from Thursday to Sunday. You welcome the two time, three-time defending AL, uh, NL East champion Braves. Uh, for three games, all matinees, too. So if you're able to get a ticket, that sounds like good days to go down to Nationals Park. Then you head out west and face the defending World Series champion Dodgers and probably the favorite to repeat uh, this year. And then the Cardinals, who are also looking to uh, make, remake the playoffs and uh, win the Central again. Uh, and then you face the Cardinals again a week later and the Mets again and then the Blue Jays. I mean, it's just an absolute gauntlet uh, <laughs> of an April. Uh, I, 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 It's, you know... You can't have too high expectations because the schedule is difficult, right? But I, 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 you can't see, like, I think there are 25 games in April. You know, you can't go, like, 10 and 15 or 9 and 6, something like that. You know, you need to probably be around 500 to feel like you had a solid April. Mm-hmm. And the, the schedule really doesn't even let up a little bit until really mid-May. Um, and, and barely at that. And that's just kind of, I guess, the reality of playing in the NL East this year. But I think the good news uh, um, for, for Nats fans is opening up with the Mets and playing them, you know, a handful of more games just in the month of April is that the Mets are going to be good. They're going to be competitive this year. They added a lot of talent. Uh, we all know that. But they're not 100% healthy to start the season. They need to get some pitching back and they need to get some things clicking. I think they're going to be really similar to the nationals in that way that they need their pitching to get healthy and, and stay healthy. Um, And they're going to need, they have a lot of talent here and there, but they just kind of need everything to click. Um, And I have a feeling it might take a little bit for that to get going. So I think playing the Mets there at the the stretch at the beginning of the season, maybe you can steal some wins, not necessarily steal, but have some good games, get some wins against uh, some divisional opponents there to start the season because they might take a little bit uh, more to get going. Whereas, you know, your Braves are going to be tough games. Of course, the defending champs and the Dodgers are going to be tough games. Really, the whole month of April, even until mid-May, is just tough, 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 tough. Yeah, you, you mentioned, like, how it kind of leads up in May, but does it? I mean, it's 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 the Marlins to start off with, but then you got Atlanta, New York, the Yankees, uh, Phillies, Dimebacks, Cubs. The Cubs aren't going to be great, but they're going to be competitive. You know, they're, they're, they're in that weird yeah. zone of... Trying to compete, but also maybe doing a rebuild. But they're mm-hmm. they're they're going to be at at worst pesky, um, and then the Orioles, uh, Cincinnati, who made the playoffs last year. No more Trevor Bauer, but that's still a talented roster. They're not their Cincinnati Reds of like you know twenty seventeen, uh, and, and the Brewers. Some people are are predicting to win the Central too. You know yeah, your I easiest think- <laughs> your easiest opponents are probably Miami and Arizona again. Like you play them in April. I mean, and then uh, and then the Orioles. 
Right. I mean, I hopefully, yeah, you can get some wins there against the Phillies, Arizona. They compete against Chicago um, and then get some wins against the Orioles, Reds. But then it, it heats right back up with the Brewers, the Braves after that. Um, this schedule, it's it's just going to be be tough. That's just the reality, I guess, of playing in the division that they're playing in this year. Um, and they, they can't get off to a slow start that they're known notoriously for. Yeah. And looking ahead even further, June and July, your, your toughest opponents there are probably Pittsburgh and Miami in June. Um, and then in July, Miami and Baltimore, they play the, the Marlins. Technically they play the Marlins once a month, at least one game a month. So, you know, we've talked about before the Marlins, while they're probably the worst team in this division, they're not going to be pushovers. They're not going to be like we said, like Marlins of 2014, where the Nationals are going to be able to rattle off 15, 16 wins against them of the 19. Uh, they're they're going to be a tough out. Um, August is pretty tough as well. They're easy. They're the easiest opponent there. I see at least as Miami again, because uh, you play the Cubs, the Phillies, the Braves, the Mets, Braves again, the Blue Jays uh, again, uh, Brewers. Uh, Mets and Phillies, all teams looking to compete. Um, and, and then in September, so, you know, you, you play, you'll you play Pittsburgh, Miami, uh, the Rockies twice, and the Red Sox to finish. You know, Amy, you kind of hear in other sports, uh, I think this is a, a former Washington football head coach, Mike Shanahan-ism, but, like, it's not who you play, it's when you play them. And looking mm-hmm. at the schedule, you know, in the first half, the Nationals play the Cardinals twice, the Dodgers twice. I think even the Padres once, um, and the the quote unquote worst teams on their schedule they don't play until uh, the end of the season, where it might be too little, too late. You know, it would be nice to have a couple of series series against the Pirates or the Red Sox or the Rockies early on in the season, but they play Colorado twice in September. They finish with Boston, the only time they play, um, and the second series with Pittsburgh is in the early, early September as well. So. You know, you would wish you would maybe kind of get, I don't want to call them a cupcake, but an easier matchup early on in the season. But it's its the opposite. You got all your tough matchups early, which could play to your advantage. Hey, if you get through them above 500, then your schedule theoretically gets easier once you get to September. And that's when you can make a real push. But it also on the flip side could be too little too late. Mm-hmm. That's why we talk so much about hoping that everybody to start the season, especially this pitching staff, because that's going to be the key, especially in this division, um, to winning games is having a healthy pitching staff, especially for the Nationals, obviously. So you want to start the season healthy and you want to start the season well, and that's the most important thing. And just like you said, sometimes it's it's when you when you play these guys and sometimes, you know, uh, um, pitching matchups can be a little off at the beginning of the season with days off. Uh, it takes a little bit for things to line up and it just depends on how your pitching lines up, um, who you're playing, when you're playing, but we know that they have to win at the beginning of the season. Um, that's going to be key to them having a successful season. And really for most people in the NL East, um, it's going to be important for them to win at the beginning of the season. That's why I mentioned maybe the Mets not having their whole entire rotation back till mid season um, is going to be important um, where the nationals right now we think are, are healthy. Um, but the Braves, of course, are always going to be tough games, and we know the Marlins are competitive this year. Um, who knows what Philly's going to do? So no matter what, it's going to be tough. They have to win win to start the season. Yeah, and I think that's a great point about the Mets too. Uh, and they play, obviously, all of these opponents uh, pretty regularly. They play 19 times against each the Atlanta, Miami, Philly, and, and um, New York. Um and here's as you're looking at the last year's standings. Of course, the Nationals tied for last place. But you know, going back, I, and I preach this every single season. You're you, you were kind of just touching on that. You, you've got to do well in the division. This is probably the toughest this National League East has been from top to bottom in some time. Even with the Marlins trying to compete, they're not likely to compete, but they're at least trying to. Um, every season the Nationals have made the playoffs, they've done really well in the division. Uh, 2012, over 58 percent winning percentage. Uh, 2014, almost 60% of the time they won in the division. 2016, they do- dominated. They won om- almost over two-thirds of their games in the NL East. They won over 50 games in the NL East uh, against NL East opponents. 61% in 2017 and 2019, uh, 57.9%, almost 58% of the time. And the seasons they missed the playoffs, 13, 56%, 15, 57%. 18, only 53%. And then, of course, last year, uh, the terrible 26 and 34 year, they only went 17 and 23. 
uh, with a 42.5 winning percentage against an at least opponent. So I always say, I mean, it's going to be tough. It's going to be brutal. Yes, you face the Dodgers early. Yes, you face the Cardinals early. But if you win those games with the end of the division, you know, it's killing two birds with one stone. It's giving you a win and it's giving them a loss. So that's the easiest way for the Nationals to find success this year uh, is by winning within the division. And I think other things. And also, Amy, like, you know, it's corny. It's cheesy. It's cliche. But iron sharpens iron. You know, you play these tough teams well and you win. You might be able to play the Cardinals, the Dodgers uh, a little harder. Uh, you're some of those AL East opponents that are looking to compete. Uh, you might be able to play those guys a little more tough uh, because you are, you know, going through such a tough schedule within your own division. Right. I think that's a really good point. And one thing about the Nationals is unique is, of course, they have the young star and Juan Soto and Victor Robles, but they have a lot of older, experienced guys who are going to, you know, aren't afraid to face the young stars in DeGrom or whoever it may be. Uh, they might have a more mature approach going into some of these divisional games where other teams are younger um, and, and it can take a little while for them to settle in um, towards the middle or end of the season. So that's one thing that the Nationals might have going for them is they have this mix of ages. Um, and it looks like they're going to have, you know, Josh Harrison, who's what, 33 and in, instead of Carter Keyboom. Um, so this, again, for a couple years in a row, this roster is trending a little bit older, uh, which sometimes that can use, you can use to your advantage. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, and as for fans, as, as, people who cover the team. It's also exciting because there are no real lights off. There's no cupcakes. Every game's important. Every opponent is going to be tough. So you should be into for some good, interesting, fun baseball throughout the course of the season, of course, as opening day gets underway the other day, which brings us to our final topic. We wanted to get some season predictions on the line. You know, that's the time of year for every that. Uh, everyone is making their playoff predictions. We are no different. We want to make some predictions. I believe, looking back at last year, Amy, you did pretty well. Um, no expanded playoff this year. Back to the original five teams making it in each uh, league. Um, but let's start with the National League. Who are your three division winners in the National League? Okay, I'm going to go with the Braves, okay. which I, I know you will too probably. Yep. Got to go with the defending defending uh, title winners. Um, in the Central, I kind of want to go with the Cardinals, but I, I don't think Arenado is enough, so I'm going to go with the Brewers. Okay. I'll, um, I'll go Cardinals. And, and in the West, I've, I've got to go with the Dodgers, obviously. Dodgers. All right. Yep, so we are two of three the same. Uh, I've got the Cardinals in the Central. Uh, I, I think they've got experience. At, they've got a really good team. Arenado helps a lot, but it might not be enough, like you said. Um, but, uh, you know, Jack Flaherty, I think, is, gonna, is primed for to be mm -hmm. one of the best pitchers in baseball this year. Um, I, that's just a great organization up and down. Even more impressive when you look back at the Nationals, sweat them in the NLCS. Um, they always compete. They're always going to be in the mix. They're the Cardinals. So I, I think I'm not counting out the Brewers. I think they'd be a tight, tight race like the Central has been for the past couple of years. But I, I, I see the Cardinals coming on top. And, yeah, I'm sticking with the Braves and the Dodgers. Um they're, they're the champions of their respective divisions until someone else says otherwise. Uh, but I think the Mets, Mets can make it interesting. And, and the Padres. Don't forget about the Padres. The Padres can make it interesting out west too. Um, what about the American League real quick? Who do you have winning those divisions? I'm going Yankees, White Sox, Athletics. Oh, okay. I'm going Yankees, White Sox, Angels. I, I, this, I'm going to do this until the end of time. Mike Trout is going <laughs> to make the playoffs. It's to happen. It has to it has happen, to happen one right? year. Mike Trout has to make the playoffs again at some point. Anthony Rendon <laughs> has to make the playoffs again at some point. Uh, Otani is going to finally play a full season. Um, mm -hmm. Joe Madden is just a, a masterful manager uh, at times in the way he uses analytics and, 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 and sees the game. At some point, the Angels have to make the playoffs again with Mike Trout. I'm going to say it's this year. Uh, I'm, I'm taking the Angels to win the division. But, uh, yeah, I'm with you with Yankees and White Sox. I think the White Sox are, are after all those long, tough years since I winning know, their Bobby. last World Series, I think they are here and they're here to stay. They're going to be good. They're young and talented, and they're going to be good. Interesting to see how Tony La Russa does at the, at the helm. Um, but I think that roster is going to be too, too good uh, to compete. And you got teams like the Indians. Um, the Twins will be good, too. Don't get me wrong, yep. but they, they got an older roster, at some, it seems like. And, and we got teams like the Indians who are kind of sort of rebuilding. They lost Lindor, obviously. Um, but, so I think that's spending money. Yeah. You know. yeah. Who knows? I mean, they're, they're, they're kind of just spending money, but they're not. I don't know. 
Um, but yeah, so I got the White Sox and the Yankees in, in those uh, divisions. Who are your two wild cards in each league? Um, I have um, Nats, Padres, and the NL. Ooh. God, that'd be um, so stressful. I want to take the Mets, but I just what we just talked about. I think if the Nats get out to a better start, I think they'll end up uh, uh, sneaking into the wild card spot. In, spot and in the AL, I have Jays and Twins. Jays and Twins. Okay. Um. I've got – you might be changing my mind on the spot here, Amy. Ooh. I was going to go Mets-Padres, Padres being the the one hosting the game. But, you know, I, 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 I say all the time, don't tell me, show me. You know, they're the champs until someone says they're not, stuff like that. The Mets are going to Mets. New owner does not change that just yet. They have to show me that that hasn't changed. So – I am changing my, my, my prediction at the last second. I was going to go Mets. Uh, this is going to come back and bite me in the butt. But there I'm we gonna go. Get, I I'm know. Gonna... Anytime you change it, Bobby, it always comes back to get you. And, and I was kind of going on the reverse psychology thing. Where it was like, if I don't pick the Nationals to make the playoffs, and then, my, then they will. Right, and right. And I can't be that disappointed that I was wrong. But now I'm putting all my eggs in the Nationals basket. So it's going to be a hit or miss. Um, yeah, I'll go Nationals, Padres too. But I think the Padres will win that National League wild card game. Mm-hmm. And in the American League, I got Blue Jays as well. I think that team is crazy young talented. We saw them make the playoff push last year too. They're going got better. Um, and my second one, I'm going to go A's. I'm going to go the Athletics. I, okay. I, they're a team that's always there competitively. I love how they construct their roster. Um, you know, they, they we, we saw them in uh, the playoffs last year. Uh, they, they've made the playoffs a handful of times recently. They just can't get out of that wild card game at times. It seems like. Uh, wait, no, hold on. Do I make? The, do I pick the Rays? No, no. The Rays lost too many of their pitchers. I'm going. Yeah, I'm going. I know up. the AL East is going to be competitive. You kind of yeah. want to. It, no, it's going to be very competitive. It's probably the next competitive division outside the National League East. Mm-hmm. But because so, and the Rays lost a handful, you know, of their right. pitching. Yep, I'm gonna go and but they develop well. But I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go the Athletics. It's gonna be close, but there might even be a game 163. But I'm gonna go with the Athletics. Okay. Um, your league championship series for each one, real quick. All right, I'm gonna go Braves, Dodgers, Yankees, White Sox. Okay, I'll do the exact same. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was reminded too as well. I think. The, each of those two, each of those four teams in their respective leagues finish one two, so they won't face each other in the first round. They'll mm-hmm. see each other in the championship series, and then for the World Series, who do you have? This is tough. I think the Yankee. I mean, I. Uh, I'm gonna go White Sox Dodgers. Ooh, all right. I have and- to put the Dodgers in there. I just the Yankees. I I just think they need one more starter. Um. And depends on how Luis Severino comes back, but I'm going to go White Sox. I think this is their year. I really like the White Sox, and you have to go with the Dodgers, I think. Yeah. How about you, Bobby? It's not. It's it's hard to pick against the White Sox, I think, at least. I agree with you there, but I am going to. <laughs> I'm going to pick the Yankees. Um, oh, okay. And the, I'm going to pick the Dodgers again, and I'm going to pick the Yankees over the – I think this was my pick last year. It was. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Baseball has not seen a repeat champion since the Yankees in the late 90s, 2000. I just, I love that about the sport. I'm going to keep going on that, that we get a new champion every year. I think the Dodgers are probably the best equipped team to repeat since we've, since those Yankees. Um, but I'm going to say that history repeats itself and, and continues on without a repeat champion. I think the, the Yankees, Garrett Cole, has a Steven Strasburg like World Series performance and is named the MVP. The Yankees get healthy at the right time and get hot at the right time. And I'm going to say the Yankees in seven in the Fall Classic. Oh, I'm going to say I'm going to go with the Dodgers. I'm going to go with the Dodgers in seven. Hey, as long as we get a full season of baseball and a full postseason. Uh, although I did, I did really enjoy the eight team postseason last year. Cause it was just baseball all the time for like that. It was like March madness. Like we talked about the like first like weekend of, of playoff games, but it will be good to get back to the normal stretch of thing. All 462 game season. So as long as we get the whole season in, don't really care if our predictions are wrong. It'd be just good to have a full season of baseball back with fans in the stands. 
I know. I'm excited. That's I think that's going to be the most. That's what I'm looking forward to the most is having fans back in the stands and it feeling somewhat normal. Um, and, and we'll deal with the postseason later. Yeah. Well, that's going to do it for this episode. Again, our last episode of uh, spring of the off season, technically, as the opening day gets underway Thursday night. Nationals, Yan- uh, no, not Yankees. Nationals, Mets, seven o'clock on ESPN. Uh, the first Masson broadcast will come on Saturday and Sunday. Assuming the weather holds up, it's pouring right now as we're recording this podcast, but I think they should be cleared by tomorrow night. So the first Masson uh, broadcast will be a Saturday, 3.30 pregame, Bob and FP, and uh, I believe uh, 12.30 pregame on Sunday, both on Masson 1. Masson uh, will be your home for the Nationals throughout the course of the regular season. Uh, Thanks for tuning in to the Mass and All Access podcast and watching along on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Don't forget to subscribe to the Mass and All Access podcast on your favorite podcasting platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or SoundCloud. I teased it at the beginning of the episode. There will be a special announcement on the For the Podcast on the audio platform only. So if you are subscribed to the podcast, you will see it pop up in the next day or so. Uh, if not, go subscribe right now. Go t- wherever you've listened to podcasts. Hit subscribe for the Mass and All Access Podcast Nationals, and you'll see that special announcement in the next couple of days. I'm pretty excited about it. It's something I came up with uh, over the past couple of days, and I've been working on. Um, I think Nationals fans will really appreciate it. I hope you do, at least. Um, so look, keep a lookout for that, uh, and make, be sure to subscribe. At Amy Jennings News for Amy, thank you so much for joining me today. Glad to see your health uh, and healthy and safe. And um, We'll talk next week and after a regular season uh, games. I can't wait. See you next week. All right. Thank you all again for tuning in. I'm at Bobby underscore Blanco on Twitter. Be sure to give me a follow as well uh, throughout the course of the regular season. Of course, all Nationals coverage on MassInSports.com from Mark Zuckerman. All pregame and press conferences will be on our YouTube account, so be sure to subscribe there as well. We will be hearing from Davey Martinez, Mike Rizzo, and Max Scherzer before opening day. So if you're listening to this before opening day, you can hear from those three guys on our YouTube channel. That's going to do it. Stay safe. Stay healthy, everybody. We'll see you next week.